Okay, well, welcome, welcome. We are thrilled that um, so many people have come out. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to thank, um, we've got a number of board members and advisory board members in the audience. Um, and for a place like Bigelow, we really rely on our board for a lot of expertise and support. And so we are so grateful. We we're, we work them. <laughs> I'm looking at I'm looking at you, uh, Barry and Howard. So if you are an advisory board or a board member, if you could raise your hands, we just love to give you a big round of applause. So at Bigelow, about 75% of our budget is uh, federal grants and contracts mostly. And so I also like to thank the taxpayers of America. Um, Bigelow is a very cheap and scrappy place in many respects. So you get a lot of bang for your buck um, at Bigelow. And thank you so much for the, the support through your tax dollars. And then donors. So we could not do what we do um, without the support of donors because federal grants and contracts don't pay for everything. So literally everything we do gets underpinned um, by the support from the very generous donors that we have. And we have many of you in the audience too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And a big shout out for H.M. Payson because they underwrite this um, Cafe Size series every year and we're so grateful to have that. Okay, so we're gonna get started now. Um, for those of you who are online, welcome. Um, if you have a question during the, the presentation, you can write it into the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen and we will answer those. We're gonna stop midway to answer questions. Those of you that are here, we'll be passing around a microphone so you can um, ask your questions. So now it is, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Nicole Price, Dr. Nicole Price. So Nicole wears two hats here. She is a senior research scientist that has had a very successful program um, in um, marine ecology. She's done important work on corals and kelp, um, but she really has uh, taken, I think, probably what she says is very unexpected turn into cows um, and is leading our largest program right now um, where she is working with a whole slew of scientists across the laboratory and across the country, in fact. And I think one of the, and she is doing that primarily through the Center for Seafood Solutions. The Center for Seafood Solutions was uh, the brainchild of Graham Shamil, who was the previous executive director. And the idea of the center was you're going to immerse scientists into the community in an area like seafood, whether that is aquaculture, fisheries, because then you're going to really learn what are the gaps in knowledge, where are they having issues, and then she would then write grants, or Jennifer and I would go out and hit the road and try to raise the money to fill those gaps, and it was a wonderful way to build partnerships with industry across the state, and she's just done a beautiful job of that. In terms of coast cow consumer, She's really good, it feels like every time she bumps up against a wall, she figures out a way to find the person or the people or the group that she needs to go up and around it um, and has just built this incredible team. So with that, I give you Nicole Price. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I wanna check first that you can hear me. Okay, and hi everybody online. I'm going to try to stay here so I'm in their view as well. Um, thank you for coming tonight and thank you for the wonderful introduction, Debbie. So, tonight's talk is centered around this question Can we use algae to reduce a cow's carbon footprint? And you may be asking yourself, wait a second, I thought this was the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences, and I thought Debbie just said you have a PhD in marine ecology. How did you end up studying cows? Are you looking at seagrass grazing underwater? What's happening here? Um, well, in about 2015, there was some ideas that were put forward about using algae as feed additive for dairy cows in particular, and probably beef cows as well, cattle as well. Um, and Bigelow has been exploring three novel feed additives that are based on algae. And we'll get through those later tonight, why they've been developed, how we think they're exciting. But I'd like to organize my talk around these framing questions that, so that we can keep ourselves moving forward. Um, first, I'm gonna center on who. Who did we put together for the team to get this research advanced and started? 
why are we doing this research? What are we doing? What, what exactly are we studying and how are we doing it? And then where in the process of the research are we? How, how close are we to getting towards something exciting? And I hope you'll be as jazzed as I am by the end of this talk. I also want to start by actually having you watch a video that was made by the daughter of one of our very key scientists on this project, um, Steve Archer. And this is a wonderful video explaining the project. So I'll let it go ahead, except I can't because it's in laser form. Would give me one second here. Mm, click that off. Here we go. Methane is a carbon-containing greenhouse gas with about 30 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. It occurs naturally deep underground and is also produced by microbes called methanogens that live in marine sediments, soils, and the digestive systems of ruminant animals like cows, goats, sheep, deer, and moose. Humans primarily contribute to methane in the atmosphere through our use of fossil fuels and through agriculture, especially raising livestock. Even though farmers are taking important strides towards reducing their environmental impact, cows still account for more than half of all livestock greenhouse gas emissions, 44% of which come from ruminant burps. Fortunately, our team of scientists from Bigelow Laboratory and partner institutions might just be able to help lower the cow's carbon hoofprint with ocean-based solutions. Compared to humans, cows have a complex digestive system designed to get the most nutrition out of grass and other plant matter. In a special compartment of the stomach called the rumen, cows host an array of microscopic organisms that break down fibrous plant material into digestible compounds that are used to produce milk and meat. This is great because it means cows can get energy and nutrition from foods we can't, like grass, but a small fraction of these microorganisms in the rumen are methanogens. The downside is that these methanogens produce methane, which is burped out by the cow instead of being used for energy by the cow's body. In order to reduce methane burps from cows, researchers are working on developing a feed supplement derived from seaweeds, microalgae, or a mixture of the two. When fed to cows, these algae-based supplements can disrupt methanogens' activity. If so, these supplements would reduce methane production in the rumen and instead help the cow retain that energy to put towards milk or beef production. Algae might also safely enhance overall feed digestibility. It seems great, but here's the catch. Will it be possible to produce enough algae to feed lots of cows? The average cow can eat more than 20 kilos of dried plants and grain, or about 44 boxes of dry spaghetti every day and there are about 93 million cows in the United States. If we want to replace 2% of their dry food with a supplement, we would need about 13 million metric tons of algae every year, which accounts to more than 26 billion boxes of spaghetti. That's more than double the annual global harvest of seaweed. And that estimate doesn't include the 1.3 billion cows living outside the US. Because of the sheer volume of algae required to supplement the diet of all these cows, it's impossible to sustainably harvest it all from the wild. Algae would need to be grown on farms in the ocean, on the coast, or on land. For coastal economies, these algae farms could serve as a shift from more traditional ways of making an income at sea. While in landlocked areas, it may serve as a link between manure recycling systems and land-based algae cultivation. Hopefully, our research here at Bigelow will help us find a way to reduce methane emissions from cattle while also increasing their productivity and boosting coastal and agricultural economies. Healthier cows, healthier economies, and a healthier environment. What's not to love? Yay. <laughs> So again, quickly, that um, video was made by interns from this research program, two interns. One is the daughter of one of the senior research scientists, Steve Archer, at the lab here, and another is the son of one of the main seaweed companies. So it was a really wonderful collaboration to put that together. This whole project is actually a giant collaboration. So it, it started some years ago, but it really built through a transdisciplinary program. And I'm starting this talk with the acknowledgement of all the participants of this team because it is a giant team effort to make it happen and i just have the honor of speaking about it to you tonight but this these are all the people who are doing the hard work to make it happen 
And if you are interested, hold on, this isn't quite where I need it to be. We've got internships for this program, and to date we've had 20 paid interns, and we're looking for more each and every summer. So if you've got young ones that are interested, we'd love to have them. We also get this work done with the advisement of very knowledgeable people from their sectors. So we have a team of folks who help us from dairy operations to understand what we need to generate for feed, how it can get used on a dairy farm, what it means for the dairy processors, and what it means for the people who are doing outreach efforts at these farms. We have a lot of help from the algae production side, whether it be microalgae or macroalgae, and we'll get into that more later. And then there's a whole regulatory framework that um, is built around the safety of feed and the efficacy of feed and whether or not you can get it certified organic or certified for carbon markets. So we have advisors from those groups as well. And then we have some oversight for how well we're um, conducting our research program and meeting our goals. To date, we've raised about $25 million for the research that we're doing. Um, our first major investor was from the Shelby Coulomb Davis Charitable Fund, who gave us a very generous donation to get things going in the world of seaweed. We've gotten some funding recently from the USDA, United States Department of Ag um, Systems, from their flagship program, the Sustainable Ag Systems Program, from their organic program as well, and from our local Northeast SARE program. And finally, we've gotten some limited investment from some dairy processes themselves, Stonyfield and Organic Valley. So I know that video spoke very quickly. We tried to pack a lot of information in two minutes just to remind you how do cows make methane? It's not out the back end where you might think only 5% of the methane they generate comes out that end. The rest of it comes out the front end in form of burps. And this is commonly referred to as enteric methane. And this is my kid's favorite slide for sure. <laughs> Cows lose about 6 to 12% of their energy when they're burping out that methane. That's carbon that's getting carried away from the body that could otherwise be used to form more milk or more meats for the industry. So if we can find ways to reduce enteric methane, we're also finding the co-benefit potentially of increasing productivity for those farms. Farms dairy are really motivated to address the global greenhouse gas problem. In fact, they have made some commitments to 2050 to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Most of the methane um, that is emitted in the United States comes from uh, livestock production. And in fact, if you look at the total carbon footprint of cow dairy production or beef production. There are parts that generate carbon dioxide, parts that generate nitrous oxide, but far and away, the enteric methane emissions or those burps are the largest source of greenhouse gases in a dairy or a beef farm operation. So let's think about scale. How big is this problem in the US? How widespread is it? So this is a map of milk production and where there are these darker red spots, that's where there is more milk produced per square mile. So milk production is concentrated really geographically um, across the US. And it's really, we have a widespread of farm sizes in the US from family farms that will have just a handful of cows, but 50% of the milk generated in the US comes from large farms that have a thousand or more head of cattle. These asterisks show the states that have targeted greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, policies or goals that have been created either by the governor in that state or, or some other missive. And what's really interesting is there's a nice overlay of where dairy production is happening and where states have these goals with the exception of, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that, with the exception of maybe Idaho, for instance, or Texas. So there is a lot of motivation to do something about this greenhouse gas emission issue, especially methane. What are the dairy farmers have not been sitting, not uh, been sitting on the wayside, not pondering this problem for some time, especially because it also relates to efficiencies on the farm. So what I'm going to walk you through now is what dairy farmers have been doing to reduce their methane emissions. And as we move down this list, the, the solutions to the problem increase in the complexity, 
the amount of money it would take to implement them and the amount of time it make to, might take to implement them. So for decades, farmers have been optimizing feed efficiencies by improving their diets or grazings to have higher conversion ratios of that forage to actual production. They've also been doing selective breeding to find animals that generate less methane on average. But more recently, people have become really interested in rumen manipulation. So the rumen is that first stomach that the, the feed is digested in. And namely, people have been looking at feed additives or even potentially inoculations or, or vaccinations that introduce um, microbes that are good for digestion but don't contribute to that methane production. There's always a question of, well, should we just step away from dairy altogether and look at alternative protein production to serve our human demand? And while that's a viable option for a certain fraction of the population, much of the globe still depends on dairy production as the primary source of protein, especially for kids of young ages. And then there are some really crazy ideas about there for methane recovery from cows. This is an example of a mask that people are proposing to put on cows to convert the methane that is come, they're exhaling into carbon dioxide. I don't know how viable this option is or sustainable it is, but it's out there. Today's talk is gonna focus on that room and manipulation option. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about methane recovery, particularly in the form of anaerobic digestion and how our proposed feed additives may blend with that to, to provide an overall exciting solution. So when we're looking at a potential feed additive to reduce methane emissions, there's some qualities that we really wanna isolate that would make it a very exciting prospect. First, it has to be safe for both the people who consume the dairy product and for the cows that are getting fed the product. Secondly, it has to be effective. This doesn't just mean that it's effective at the point of feeding the animal and reducing the enteric methane emissions. It means that it has to have a low carbon footprint in its production process cradle to grave so that you're not just trading one issue for another issue. You, you have to make sure that the carbon footprint of generating and distributing it is less at least than the um, reduction that you are getting from um, stopping the cow burps. It's gotta be a net removal of carbon dioxide or of a carbon product. It's gotta be easy to use for dairy farmers and feed manufacturers so that they can uh, just add it to their existing supply chains. It's gotta be profitable for every step in that supply chain for the algae producers and processors, the feed producers and the dairy producers and processors. It's gotta be scalable. You just heard about how many billions of boxes of spaghetti cows eat per year. So we've gotta be able to produce enough to feed all of those animals. It's gotta meet federal drug administration Food and Drug Administration certification standards, which is a changing landscape, and I'll get into that later. And it can be organic certified, which is exciting because this is a group of early adopters that are most likely to try to implement a new feed strategy to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So there's some options out there on the market already, and I wanna tell you about them and why they're less than ideal, which is why we're motivated to keep going with this research. A an additive is less than 2% of the diet. So it's not really changing their whole dietary structure per se. What's already out there are things like rumensin, which is an antibiotic. And for a variety of reasons, we wanna be feeding those less frequently to our, our animals. Agolin has a cilantro or coriander-based product. Neutral has come out, the names get really funny. Um, that's based on garlic and citric acid. DSM has just introduced Bovair, which is based on a chemical called 3NOP that's been approved in EU, but not yet in the US. And then there's a couple of new companies that are popping up that are based on a red algae, alga called Asparagopsis. There's two species in particular. And these have produced um, options like brominata and sea grays, and the, the active ingredient in those cases is bromoform. So what did the data say about how relatively effective each of these options are? Well, those first four are not that effective at reducing enteric methane emissions. 3-NOP or the Bovair is maybe the most exciting by reducing 30% of those emissions. 
the other two that are based on asparagopsis are really effective. 80% on average, sometimes more than 90% effective. But they're very difficult to scale production. They're never going to be able to meet that demand for how many cows there are on the planet that we need to feed. I want to talk very quickly about the bioactive compound that is really exciting in the asparagopsis species. They're halogenated compounds that are naturally synthesized by algae. Not only asparagopsis, but many different species of algae can make these halogenated compounds. They're really quite effective at reducing the methanogens that are responsible for generating methane in that rumen system. But you might have also heard that these are somewhat toxic and listed as a probable carcinogenic. So there is concern about what is the fate of this bromoform once you feed it to the animal. Where is it metabolized? Is it broken down? Does it carry through to the milk, for instance? You wouldn't want that. Um, what is its mass balance after you fed it to the animal? Our lab tests at Bigelow have indicated that bromoform is broken down within minutes of the animal having consumed it. So it's not very long lived. We're also very careful to think about dosage. So there are four out of five studies that have indicated that there's no detectable bromoform that goes through into milk. One study did find it, but they also found bromoform in milk from cows that were never fed the additive. And so they likely have a contamination problem and nobody's been able to reproduce those results since. Bigelow Analytical Services provides testing facility for halogenated compounds for feed, algae, milk, urine, feces, and tissues. And we are actually assisting globally people who are working on this problem and wanting to know what the fate of their product is. We have upcoming animal trials specifically designed to trace the fate of those halogenated compounds. And one, in fact, that just started today. I also want everybody to think about the fact that the dose makes the poison. If you eat too many apple seeds, you can experience poisoning from um, some of the compounds found in those apple seeds. We are working very carefully to think about that perfect dose of the halogenated compound to affect the methanogen production and nothing else in the animal and nothing else in the product that is coming out of that. So it's a, a careful thing to consider. We're not the only ones that consider it. There's certification processes that keep everyone safe, humans and animals. These include things like BAFCO, the Association of American Feed Control Official, Officials. There are lots of algal species and certain preparations that are already listed as safe for use in feed products. And the FDA also monitors even research that's happening in this area. So for our research trials, we need to seek a food use authorization. That's because milk from research farms will enter the food supply chain. And so we need to make sure whatever we're using in our trials is also safe for that consumption. Once you've reached that ladder level, you can seek GRASS, generally recognized as safe certification that requires a series of safety trials and utility or efficacy trials. And then you can start to look for label claims from the FDA. Currently, there are two pathways for FDA for feed additives. One is either it's a nutritional supplement or the other is it's a drug. Nutritional supplement takes less than two years to certify. Drug takes 10 years. We got a climate problem right now. So that drug pathway is not that enticing for climate solution strategies. The FDA has recognized this, and the Center for Veterinary Medicine is now considering a third middle-of-the-road option. That middle-of-the-road option is a zootechnical pathway that says you can change the gut microbiome of the cow, and it won't be considered a drug, and we can fast-track its review. That particular policy is under consideration in Congress right now, so it's a very exciting time for this research. Finally, when you conduct the research, you need to make sure that your animals are cared for properly. And so there's an animal use care committee that um, regulates that at each of our partner institutions. And if you're lucky, your process is benign enough that it can also be considered as an organic certification that's managed by USDA. So there is a giant process out there to make sure that your product is safe to use. Seaweed has been used in livestock feed for hundreds of years. So this in and of itself isn't a novel idea, but using it specifically for this purpose is what's new and exciting.
And we at Bigelow are specifically asking if there are any other more readily available algae that have equally equal methane suppression potential that we should be considering. And I'm going to take this opportunity to pause for the moment and see if there's any questions from the audience that I can answer before we move on to the um, how and um, where are we in our research endeavors. Are you happy? Okay, there's a couple up front and back. I, I don't understand very much about the different types of, of algal seaweed. So what is common, what is abundant, what is under consideration? It's a great question, and it, it's definitely something I'm going to tackle in the next section of the talk. The Asparagopsis species is a tropical species. It cannot be grown in the ocean in these parts of the world. It has to be grown on land. So what we're going after specifically are the really abundant species, types of sea, uh, seaweed species that are already in production at a scale that could meet that demand. That, generally speaking, is kelp species and a limited number of other red species. Kelp are the subtitle brown macroalgae species. Um, can you speak towards why uh, dairy cows as opposed to cows uh, ultimately uh, looked after for like beef production or other types of cow grazing? Why that's like the, the starting point for this, for this solution and, and study? Yeah. Um, the the ideas really started in Australia that had a large dairy population. And for us, it was most obvious to start with dairy in the Northeast because that's a much larger commodity in this geographic region than beef. But there is definitely a lot of interest in studying beef cattle as well. The other reason is it's a little bit easier to implement a feed additive strategy for cows. They're milked three times a day. They are kept in a in a milking barn, a dairy parlor, where they are fed three times a day and you can really monitor their conditions. Beef cattle are sent out to graze in large expanses and it would be more difficult to give them a feed additive regularly. So that's why it's the more obvious first stop in dairy cattle. Yeah. Hi, Hi. very interesting. Is there a dairy herd on the peninsula we're not aware of <laughs> or are you, do you have access to a herd someplace in Maine, or is this happening in New York? Or yeah. Where's your test group? I, I glossed over it in the team group in the beginning, but we have partners at the University of Vermont, the University of New Hampshire, Minor Institute in New York, and then also at the Wolf's Neck Center in Freeport, Maine. These are all research herds that we can give our um, test animals a chance to see how things are going. But yeah, we, we didn't decide to start a, a farming business here on our property at Bigelow. <laughs> that would be a little too much. We needed the expertise of those animal researchers at those institutions to help us out. It is strange though, when you think she's, Nicole was like, we can't find enough cows. Yeah. When I became the CEO of a Marine Lab, I never thought I'd hear that. That's a problem <laughs> we needed to solve. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, great, take it away. Thank you, everybody. Okay, let me keep moving then. So how do we do this research? Well, we start at our lab here and we use uh, simulated rumen systems or little fake cows. Here's an example of what that looks like. And for you guys online, where's the camera? There you are. It's not that big, but these are little rumen systems that we can replicate and challenge with different algal species uh, generated under different conditions to see how they perform. So we affectionately refer to it as our bottle herd. It's used for high throughput screening of algae. We can test new algae processing techniques and how they affect the performance then of the feed. We can determine the exact comp composition of the bioactives that are present in it and dial in the dosing. We can evaluate the nutritional profile of those algae species, and we can test for the metals, minerals, and pathogens that might naturally be carried along with an ocean-produced product. Finally, we can really estimate what we expect for that feed conversion efficiency and if it might indeed allow for better energetics for the animal. But we've also got to understand people. 
we can maybe come up with a solution, but if nobody's incentivized to implement it, then that solution is useless. And so we really need to think about how people feel about algal supplements and what would help them be more likely to adopt it. So we use simulations, different scenarios, and a lot of surveying to understand farmers' needs. And we use things like techno-economic analyses to identify the profit, potential profitability and production of, uh, of an ingredient and where we can find economies of scale, for both the dairy farmers and the algae producers. We use life cycle assessment to understand that full, full carbon footprint of the product from generating it, packaging it, moving it from the coast to interior states in particular and what that might mean for the overall benefit of the of the application what are the barriers to adoption what are the limitations that people are experiencing why aren't dairy farmers picking it up or why aren't algae producers interested in marketing to that particular sector yet what does it mean to have an alternative livelihood option for people who have been wild capture fishers for decades and want to move into aquaculture? Is that an easy transition? How can we help them make that transition more easily? And what are the economic impacts to the rural communities that are depending on these dairy farms or these aquaculture industries for their local economy? And finally, what are the carbon market opportunities for both the algae producers and for the dairy farmers? There are some for each. And then finally, how do we do this research? To get to your question, no, we don't have cows here, so where do we do it? We do it at these research farms, and there's a lot that goes into these multifaceted um, experiments. Our animal feeding trials are designed to test things like palatability. Does the cow like the taste of it, or is it going to avoid it altogether, and then we're stuck? What happens to the milk quality and yield for um, animals that have been fed our innovative feed ingredient? What does it mean for the animal health and welfare that has been fed this ingredient? How easy is it for the farmer to use? And what are the impacts to manure? The manure then gets used as sometimes bedding, as sometimes um, a fertilizer for crops, and as sometimes a, a um, feedstock for anaerobic digestion to create biogas. What does the full throughput of our uh, feed additive due to that production system. And then obviously we've got to measure the enteric methane suppression. Does anybody know how you measure methane from a cow? All right, I find this part fascinating, so I'll let you know. You could think about coming at it from the perspective of a satellite, and then you could maybe get the whole farm measurement of what their methane emissions are. It's not very precise yet, um, it's got a lot of development to do, but that's an exciting approach to see a whole farm effect. There's other approaches like using mathematical modeling. If I put this much feed into the cow, we know this cow is that big and it's that active. How much methane is it kicking out? But that's a pretty imprecise process as well. There are backpacks, I'm not joking, that you can put on cows to have them measure uh, the amount of methane that that cow is exhaling. But you can imagine that that doesn't stay on very well and it's a little bit tricky and hard to reproduce. There are gas chambers that you can put cows in for 24 hours to get all of their emissions, but you might anticipate that that could affect their behavior a little bit too. I wouldn't like to be in there for 24 hours. Our team has elected to adopt this system, which is called the green feed system, and it is what most people use for this research. It's a, a sort of gating system that is full of cow candy. It's really enticing for the cow to visit it. The lady will have a um, ear tag on her that has an RFID. So when she puts her head into that system, it says, oh, hi, Betsy, how are you doing? What are you breathing out for methane today? And it takes those recordings several times a day for five minutes at a time. The cows get trained on these systems, and because it's full of stuff that they like to eat, they actually line up one after another to come visit day in and day out. So you get quite a lot of measurements, and it's not too, um, not too affecting their behavior. We're also really excited about this option that we're proposing now and trying to raise funding for, and that's the idea of getting printable tiny microscopic methane sensors that could be placed on the ear tag. And so that means that every time that Betsy goes to get milked, 
she's not only reading off um, how much milk she generated that day, but also how much methane she generated that day. That puts the power of knowledge right in the farmer's hands, which is something that we've learned in our surveys they're really seeking. They want to know, if I'm going to invest in this feed additive, how effective is it? All right, so that's how we measure methane in the cow. Where are we in the evolution of the products that we've been considering? I'm going to run through this fast and then talk about our three products specifically. So things got started with Asparagopsis taxiformis. But remember our list of idealized feed additive characteristics? It fails on several fronts. So we thought, well, let's go to another species that we know is really abundant in coastal Maine. It's wild harvested quite a bit, and maybe it could be cultivated. Does that work? Well, we found that it's got some of those characteristics, but it's not that effective at all at reducing enteric methane emissions. So we have a paper out on this one recently. So then we moved on to something that's produced at a large scale on these coasts, and that's sugar kelp. It's imperfect too, but we're starting to discover ways to make it more perfect and to boost that effectiveness. And then we think that it can reach a lot of other issues. It is already as a species grass certified, for instance. We also really want to consider microalgal species because they have a very large production potential and maybe could be cultivated in the middle of the country so you have less of a transportation footprint to reach those dairy farms. And then finally, we've been considering a green chemistry alternative. Just curious, how many of you have heard the term green chemistry before? A couple, okay. Well, we'll walk through that too, just because um, it's a new idea. The truth is each of these options has a role and we need as many choices as possible to have widespread implementation. So I don't present any of these as the best option. They're all an option that should be exercised. Okay, so first, the sugar kelp option. One reason that I think it's exciting is we're already producing next year likely two tons in Maine and Alaska combined. This is nearly enough to address the organic dairy industry in the Northeast. So we are getting very close to having a, a demand supply issue attained. Secondly, I'll bring you back to this species, the Asparagopsis, that was really exciting because sometimes it doesn't produce much, but if you sort of tickle it when you're cultivating it with extra nutrients, you can get it to produce a lot of that bioactive compound. Well, sugar kelp on its own doesn't produce quite as much as asparagopsis, but we started fiddling around with things like pureeing it and pickling it in a process that we call boosting, which gives the knowledge that we have about the photophysiology and, and biochemistry of seaweeds and encourages it in the processing stage to help us generate a lot more of that bioactive compound. And we can get some really enhanced bioactive concentrations and up to the level of asparagopsis. But remember, this is a species that is widely cultivated already and could meet demand. Here's an example of the pureed version of it, and we can pass it around later. It doesn't even smell that bad, so don't worry about that. But I'd love you to take a look at it and see what its, uh, its consistency looks like. And literally today, we have folks running all around the lab getting some of this boosted seaweed prepared to ship out to Minor Institute to start one of our very first feeding trials. So we're really excited about where that is. And just a reminder, this is a really exciting product because it is scalable and it is having as much bioactive compound as the very exciting version. And the way we're doing this, we think can be certified organic as well. So it's pretty promising. The next thing we're working on is microalgae. You may have heard Mike Lomas's talk a couple of weeks ago about what's happening here at the Center for Algal Innovations. We have over 3,000 strains of microalgae in our repository here. So we've got a lot of screening to do. And poor Hannah, the postdoc, has her work cut out for her. But we're looking at two strategies for microalgae. Yes, the anti-methane strategy, but we think they can offer some nutritional value as well to the animal. So we're tackling those side by side. We're also thinking about how to scale up that cultivation. So here's an example of these photobioreactors. And I, I'm come up to about there on those photobioreactors to give you scale idea. So once you feed this microalgae to the cows and they generate that manure on farm, you could take that manure and put it the anaerobic digester 
the anaerobic digester is generating biogas. Remember, it's a renewable source of energy. But it's also a source of a little bit of CO2 effluent coming out of the flues, flu system. There's some nutrients left in the sludge behind, and it generates a lot of heat. All of that can be recycled back into these photoreactors, photobioreactors, to generate more algae. So it's a contained system of these natural resources that can be otherwise limiting. You might say, well, that's great, but that looks like five panels. How much algae can you really produce in that system? That's not terribly scalable, right? Well, we have bubble hood tests going on this fall. This demo has been installed at Clarkson University, so you can go see it if you'd like. But I'd also like you to consider what's happening at farms like Stouffer Farms in New York. These are giant full-size anaerobic digester systems. And to help you with scale, that's the size of a car compared to those systems. They're each the size of an indoor soccer stadium, for instance. That's a lot of biogas that's getting generated, but a lot of those recycled resources that could go to algae production as well. And you've got the land and space here to get that set up. So this is why we think microalgae is exciting and scalable, and it offers an opportunity for vertical integration right on the farm. And then finally, we're really excited about our green chemistry approaches. So a little bit about green chemistry. It's, it's a theory. It's a set of principles. The idea is that you use sort of biocatalysts to generate chemical substances in a greener, more efficient way that has a less uh, environmental impact while you're generating it. So you're finding those efficiencies by using enzymes that you can isolate, in this case, from different algal species. These enzymes are the ones that are responsible for catalyzing the reactions that give you those halogenated compounds. We are figuring out a way to isolate those enzymes and use uh, chemostats really to get us to where we need to be for producing those bioactive compounds. We've already done bottle herd tests with some of these compounds that are really exciting. And we have feeding plans, trials planned for the future. So we're really excited about this prospect because it is infinitely scalable. All of these treatments, remember, are only as exciting as their full life cycle impact, not just the impact at the point of feeding the animal. So we're thinking about the full carbon hoofprint. That means how much CO2 is generated as you make the product and distribute it, and how does that balance out with how much methane are you reducing from the point of feeding? So we're thinking about our algal feed, but then we're thinking about capturing that methane and also reusing it in anaerobic digestion systems. I'm going to quickly walk you through some really early results that we're excited about from our simulation or computer modeling approaches. These are some of our early life cycle assessment results. So here's the example of the carbon output or carbon footprint of farms in the Northeast US and in Italy. And you can look at this metric over here. It's kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of milk. But just know that that's a relative measure of how big that carbon footprint is for those farms. And it's based on how much energy the farms use, how they manage their manure, how much cow burps are happening or enteric fermentation is happening at those farms, and what is the carbon footprint of the fields or crops. That's largely driven by how you're fertilizing your crops. And then if you have an anaerobic digester, you see that that manure management footprint disappears and even becomes negative because you're recapturing the greenhouse gases coming out of the manure and using it to make biogas. OK, so let's take a hypothetical situation where we apply this algal feed supplement on all those farms. And we assume that there's a 90% reduction of those cow burps or enteric methane emissions, which is a pretty safe assumption from what we see in our lab experiments. We can see that that red portion, the enteric fermentation portion, drops to almost nothing. And we see a very big impact on the total footprint of the farm. And then when we think about anaerobic digesters on top of that, we see an 80% reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions from that farm operation in its entirety, also accounting for what it takes to produce the algae in the first place. This is thrilling. I can't tell you how excited this is, because we are now potentially having a really meaningful impact 
on our greenhouse gas emissions and helping achieve that IPCC goal of keeping the warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees in the near future. So this is very promising, even though it's a simulation at this point, but we are really excited about it. Okay, let me move on. So to summarize, we've got a couple of ways that algae can help on a farm, but there's even more that we haven't tackled yet that we'd like to go after. First, there's the obvious reduction in enteric methane emissions that we're really thinking about hard. Then there might be changes to the greenhouse gas emissions from manure, either directly or indirectly. There's some really exciting work that just came out of Europe where they've used the same feed supplement to feed the cow, and then they also mixed it in the manure after it came out of the cow, and you had less greenhouse gases coming out of a potential manure lagoon situation. So it's the same product applied in two places to have a really big impact. That's exciting. We might also think about how it specifically affects that feedstock to add to manure and biogas generation. There's a lot of work happening on soil conditioning from algal products at the moment that indicates that you can have increased carbon dioxide removal and capture and sequestration into soils if you use special fertilizer products to help condition those soils. So there's another point where you might have carbon capture on the farm. Feed replacement, corn and soy are two of the big offenders in terms of actual greenhouse gas emissions from produce. So if you're replacing even a portion of that in their diets, you're helping out. And then the direct soil conditioner issue. One that I didn't even put up here, and it's surprising to me that it's not captured in this circle, is the amount of plastic that is used on dairy farms. And if we are starting to think about algae as a, a way to get to bioplastics, that's yet another way that it can help address greenhouse gas issues in farm management and really help address our global food system problems that are broken in terms of being able to generate very nutritional food with a very low carbon impact. So I wanna leave you with that thought that we're only at the tip of the iceberg of all the possibilities that algae can provide for dairy production or production food production worldwide. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I'll be watching online if there are any questions as well. What's the shelf life of the algae? That is such a good question. <laughs> so we started working with dried milled seaweeds because that's the way that, that most people are producing it right now. And that has a decent shelf life but it also sort of destroys the bioactive compound when you're doing it. And it doesn't allow you an opportunity to do the boosting. And it also doesn't allow you the opportunity to rinse out minerals that are in an overabundance in seaweeds for cattle feed. So that's why we headed towards this pureed product. But you might be worried about how long this can stay shelf stable. That's why we do the pickling process, which is really getting it to a low enough pH that we are able to keep it shelf stable in terms of no introduced pathogens or mold. We're working really hard on that. We've got it to be shelf stable for six months. What we're working on now is making sure that the concentration of the bioactive compound doesn't degrade over that time. So it's stable in terms of keeping it safe, but we also wanna make sure it's stable in terms of maintaining its efficacy. It's a really good question. And we're not, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> Uh, every day we're reminded about how the oceans all over the world are warming. Yeah. And I'm wondering how will, will that affect the front end of this process that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, naturally growing algae, like maybe especially that kelp that right. seems to be so promising. Yep. It's a great question, too. We do have another researcher at the lab, I'd like to call him out, Doug Rasher is doing some very exciting work looking at the native natural populations of kelp along our coastline and finding that there are populations that are disappearing in the southern portion of the state, but not so much in the northern portion of the state. And the most parsimonious explanation for that at this point is the warming problem. Fortunately, 
aquaculture happens in the winter months. So the farms get installed in September or October and they get harvested in April, May, or June. So as long as you still have access to a brood stock and a seed, you can still farm in places where the population, the native population might be suffering in the summertime. Another project that's happening at Bigelow with Nicole Poulton is developing that seed catalog and using cryopreservation or deep freezing techniques so that we can have that seed accessible to farmers whenever they need it. There's also a lot of interest in thinking about um, some populations of seaweed that are really exciting in Maine that are called skinny kelp, but their brood stock is very few and far between. And we'd like to make sure we reserve the biodiversity integrity of that species as well. So there's a lot of motivation to develop these seed stocks and to maintain them. Thanks for the question. Are there researchers working on how to do feed additives for beef cows? Feed additives for what? Oh, well, beef cows. Beef cows, yes, cows. there are. There are, and that's where we would like to fundraise next is to start working on beef cows, but we need to expand our partnerships beyond the Northeast and into the Midwest to get the right partner farms to work with in those conditions. But yes, there are some folks out of UC Davis who've done some nice work with beef cows um, and elsewhere in the world too. Yep. Yeah. Mostly that's applied just at the finishing lot stage though for the beef cows. Yeah, I was gonna fit it, follow up on that because what is the percentage of methane emitted by beef as opposed to dairy cattle? So how important is it that we move from the one to the other? I think it's important that we tackle both, but I have to admit, I don't know the difference between the relative emissions between the two. I would say hesitantly that we do our best to feed a lot of food to those dairy cows to make sure they're generating a lot of milk so it's possible that they generate more methane per individual, but I don't know that for sure. Either way, there is a large amount of beef cows, out, beef cattle out there as well that need to be addressed. But again, it's a trickier issue. How do you get it into them when they're out grazing and growing? And so there's some interesting ideas about maybe the longevity of your algal or your feed additive in that rumen system so that it can, um, can keep uh, being active for the animal and keep producing the methane emissions, but there's a lot more research to get there. I think you mentioned um, land-based cultivation of yeah. seaweed and algae. How does that work? So for the asparagopsis species, it needs to be cultivated on land. It's very fragile and very hard to grow on lines. And then it's got a tropical growing um, that's its preferred habitat. And, and we don't have a lot of tropical aquaculture of seeds, at least in the US as of yet. So mostly it's grown on land. Um, it's grown on land right now in these giant tubes that have a lot of um, water stimulation and turnover to keep them tumbling around. It requires a huge amount of light, a lot of heat and a lot of energy to keep that water circulating. And so it starts to really erode at that overall impact on the carbon footprint if you're ex 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 exuding a lot of carbon and using a lot of energy just to grow the alga in the first place, which is why I'm more excited about ocean-based culture. I have a lot of research on how ocean-based culture can impact that immediate environment in terms of ocean acidification and nutrient remediation that also excites me about that approach instead of land-based culture. I have a question about the uh, ocean-based farming. Uh -huh. I just drove across the Midwest and there are millions of acres of land mm -hmm. that grows food for cows and other animals. How many acres or square miles of ocean is going to have to be planted with this? And how would the lobstermen, you know, be affected and the tourists and everybody else. It seems like the one thing and there's 10 other people that object to it. Right, so true. <laughs> um, that's why I say that not one of these is the silver bullet solution. We need to apply all of them because I don't think we can expect ocean culture of one species of seaweed to provide enough biomass to address the problem. And I'm sorry, I don't know off my head what acreage that would need 
to, to address all the, the cows on the planet. I would say that we started thinking about a 10% inclusion rate and keep trying to get that down to 1%, so you need less and less total biomass of algae. In terms of what kind of pushback you might get from, for instance, the lobstering industry in Maine, we actually have a really interesting phenomenon happening here. And uh, Atlantic Sea Farms is a great example of celebrating this phenomenon. And it is that lobstering happens in the summer months. The seaweed cultivation happens in the winter months. So it's not a, it's not counterproductive to lobstering. It's actually a great complement to lobstering. And it provides an income during a time of year when they wouldn't otherwise have one. And this year, I think Bree Warner, who runs Atlantic Sea Farms and only takes on farmers who are converted lobstermen or also lobstermen, some of them have experienced greater revenue from seaweed farming than from lobstering in this past year. And that's the first year that we've seen that happen. So the pushback from lobstering isn't there. The pushback is from riparian landowners that have fears about the site, the sounds, or the smell of seaweed farming that are truly unfounded and so we do our best that we can to educate them what seaweed farming really looks like and what it really means for the environment and could mean for the planet. We have a question up here. If you shout it out, I'll repeat it so everybody can hear it. Wait, 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 wait. I'll come back up. Okay, right here. sorry. You know, why, why the disparity between the Italian case and the US case in your bar charts? The Italian uh, sustainability looks way better than the US. What's that about? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would venture to guess that it has something to do with the way that they fertilize and the way that they already start to use renewable energy sources as compared to the US, if I had to guess. But I will check with our clerks and partners who did that research and get an answer for you. Yeah. There's a uh, question in the yeah, back. Yeah, then... uh, I'd just like to pick up that comment about dairy versus beef. Um, in fact, um, the carbon emission and the methane emission for beef cows uh, goes up the poorer their food quality is. And for a lot of beef uh, herds in poorer economies, yeah. um, they have a huge issue with this. And in fact, there's a company in Australia that is looking at um, using molasses, which is a waste product from sugar refining, um, in feed lakes for beef cows and yep. it greatly reduces methane production. And I think that might be a really symbiotic thing to think about with your um, uh, bioactive compounds to put it into a feed lake for beef cows. Absolutely. I have a horse who loves his salt lick, so we have definitely been thinking about that. The problem is how do you control the dosing in a salt lick and how do you ensure that the relative effectiveness of that bioactive stays constant over the months that it's out there. And what happens when that feed lick gets eroded by rain? How do you replace it? I don't say that it's impossible. I say there's a lot of work to be done to see if we can get there with that process. Yeah. Uh, the question was uh, having to do with beef cattle. Mm -hmm. uh, for the last month or so of their wonderful life, many of them are in a feedlot yeah. where you can control what they're eating. That's right. Have you looked at that as an opportunity? We haven't got funded to do that yet, but that is where people who are working on beef are looking in that finishing lot only. We are excited about moving into beef, but we are also thinking about dairy from all phases of dairy production too. For right now, the research is focused only on mid-lactation dairy cows and for beef only in that feed lot. But if you go talk to farmers in any of these instances, they say, fantastic, what about my calves? What about my dry heifers? What about the young steer? There are a lot of animals in those stages too. How can we address them? There's a world of research that still needs to be done. We're at the very tip of it. It's a good point. The feedlots are where we're, we're starting. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much. Be safe going home.